I served 10 years in the Air Force Reserve, starting out as a flight medic on C-130s at Westover Air Force Base, and then later on moving on to just a regular medic, doing physicals and working in the hospital on my reserve weekends, occasionally working in VA hospitals. And then after 10 years, decided to go active duty Army. And originally, I enlisted into the Army to be a truck driver, an 88 Mike, but got injured in basic training and was on crutches for a while. And my commander saw me on crutches and I had rank on in basic, which was unusual and he found out I was prior service coming from medical, he asked if I wanted him to put me back in the hospital. And I was like, yeah, sure, that sounds great because I'm injured now. How am I going to jump out of these deuce and a half trucks and you know, not injure myself again? So he pulled strings and got me into the respiratory therapy school. And I did that for seven years. And working in major medical centers, um, it, was, it was really great. I come across as quiet and often overlooked while I was going through training. I think to deal with all of the control going on in basic training, I had started going to the church groups. It was Sunday, you could, you could volunteer and help out at church and you get to hang out and talk to other people, and there was donuts and juice and coffee. And or if you chose not to go to church, then on Sundays it was um, GI Party Day, which was cleaning everything you could think of and scrubbing the bathrooms with a toothbrush and fun stuff like that. So I hadn't been religious, but decided that I would rather do the church services than GI party all Sunday. While I was doing that, me and some of the other girls from my basic training unit, we started talking to some of the boys that were going to school for security police. So on the last day that we were going to be working before we graduated to go on to our various different tech schools, um, the boys told us they were going to take us out for lunch. And we're like, we can't go anywhere. What are we going to do? How are you going to take us out for lunch? They walked us to the other side of base over the bridge. This is at Lackland Air Force Base. There's a big bridge that spans over uh, an interstate highway sized thing. And you get to the other side of the base that's, that's civilian. And they took us to lunch in the permanent party dining hall, which was off limits to them and us. And somehow we never got caught, but it was it was um, pretty intense. <laughs> Sitting there eating with uh, hopefully hopefully not our drill sergeants. <laughs> so that was that was probably my my first transgression. I was I was 17 at that point, and it's my first time away from home. After I got to my tech school, I was dealing with a lot of um, people telling me what to do, pushing me around because I was so young and I was little and I was quiet and I was getting pushed around a lot. And me and another one of the people in my medic training, um, one of my friends, we decided that we were going to go off base and get tattoos on our next payday, except I wasn't old enough to get a tattoo. And it turns out he wasn't serious because he knew I wasn't old enough. and. Apparently these plans we were making were all just pretend, but I had made up my mind I was gonna do it. And so when it came time to go get our tattoos, he was like, no, I'm not gonna go. And I'm like, well, I'm gonna go get a tattoo. And he's like, no, you won't. You're not the kind of girl that gets a tattoo. And I'm like, excuse me? What kind of girl am I? What, you just decided who I am? And so I walked off base I wasn't, I didn't even have off base privileges. I walked off base and I got a tattoo and I lied about my age and um, got my tattoo, had to get back on base. Um, good thing is I'm a girl, so I didn't have the short, short haircut that the guys had at the level of training I was at because otherwise I 
probably would have gotten reported to my my command and I would have gotten into all kinds of trouble, but I just, I told the guard gate that I was permanent party and I'm just coming back to work. And they let me back on base and <laughs> walked back and nobody knew any different. And I got my tattoo, just things like that. When I went to the army, I had to do basic training all over again. There was a, another girl, we were, we were considered low stress basic training and so we didn't have quite as much of the craziness because it was my second time in basic training um, there were other people that were prior service there were a lot of different situations people that had college degrees that were coming in and so they didn't want to scare people off and so we were all considered people that the army didn't really want to break us completely and so we would have Battalion Liberty every weekend, which meant there was a couple block area that we could we could hang out in. There was a little exchange and a little restaurant, um, fast food restaurant, and that sort of thing. And there was a little park we could go hang out in. And um, so this this girl that I was friends with in Basic, she was a smoker, and we weren't allowed to smoke. And so she would grab a taxi. And she was really cute. The taxi driver liked her. So she would, we would grab a taxi and she would smoke cigarettes and the taxi driver wouldn't charge her to ride in the taxi if she would sit right up against next to him. And I was her battle buddy, so I would sit next to the window and we would drive around. Well, one weekend, I think the taxi driver used to look for her too, <laughs> so she'd sit next to him. Um, so one weekend, the taxi driver had to pick up affair and it was a bunch of guys from AIT again <laughs> and they were they were um, I think they were they may have been engineers it was engineers at it was at Fort Leonard Wood and they were going off base to get a tattoo and we were driving around just having fun she was smoking her cigarettes and the taxi driver said uh oh I have to pick up a pair do you mind and it's it's boys and she was like oh yeah do it, you know, Brandy, she was crazy. <laughs> so they picked up the boys and they're saying, yeah, let's go, let's go get a tattoo. So the taxi driver told her, well, I'll just, we'll go drive then, drop them off at the tattoo parlor and then I'll take you girls back to your battalion. And Brandy's like, oh, we wanna go get a tattoo with them. And I'm like, yeah, I'll get another tattoo. Sure, sure, that sounds like fun. And we got there and I got out of the car cause I was right next to the window. And then Brandy got scared and she got cold feet and she's like, no, 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 we're gonna get in trouble. How are we gonna get back? And the taxi driver said, I'll come right back and get you. You just call me and I'll call right back and I'll get you. And I'll take you right back to the base and nobody will know. And she's like, no, 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 I'm too scared. And so at this point, I'm not gonna back down. So I'm like, I'm still gonna get a tattoo. And so I went in and I got this tiny little heart. And <laughs> Just so I could say I did it. And the taxi driver came back and got me and we went back to base. And then I had to figure out how do I hide a tattoo from the drill sergeants, from everybody else. Half of these people in my basic training are tattletales, but nobody found out <laughs> except for Brandy. Brandy knew I got the tattoo. <laughs> but I think um, that was just, it was my way of, of dealing with all of the control that they put on you when you're in the military. It's, it was my way of saying, you know, something is, is mine. You can tell me where to go and you can tell me when to be there. You can tell me what I'm gonna wear, but I'll have my own little secrets, my little piece of me that you're not gonna know about. So yeah, that was, that was me, but I was always, I was always the good girl though at the same time. <laughs> Another time, none of this bad stuff. <laughs> when I was working in the medical center, I always tell people, yeah, I, I got called in to assist with open heart surgery. We had this patient that had had a really bad heart attack and the doctors had taken him in and he had, he had like um, bad genetics, I guess. He, his, everybody in his family had died early his father, his brothers had all died early from heart attacks. And he was super health nut and he ran marathons and you know, he was just did everything he could to eat healthy, 
run, everything. And um, he had a heart attack. And so they got him into surgery and they had to do open heart surgery on him. And he, he was great. Everything we asked him to do in recovery, he did. He was so strong. He was doing his deep breathing exercises, which everybody hates because they have staples in their chest and it hurts to breathe. He was doing everything he could because he wanted to get out of there and he wanted to run again. And convinced him he had to sit in the wheelchair to go out the front door to get in his car. And while wheeling him down to his car to go home that day, clean bill of health, he had another heart attack before he even got out the front door of the hospital. And they had him back in the OR, in the ICU, and we're trying to stabilize him. And one of the doctors came to me, and I'm in the ICU room, ICU room with all the other people. I'm a respiratory therapist. He's on a ventilator, which I'm taking care of. Part of what I carry, I have a fanny pack I carry on me, and I've got all these medications that I use to help people breathe. And the biggest one, albuterol. And so one of the doctors comes up to me, and he asks me how many milligrams are in a dropper full of my albuterol, and so I'm telling him how much I have per cc, and he's asking me, um, could you do a nebulizer treatment with, like, it was basically, it was gonna come out to a triple dose of normal amount that he wanted me to give, and he said that they had things, this, this patient had too much potassium in his system, and that's what was causing his heart attacks. And all the things that they could do to try to get the potassium out of his system wouldn't happen as quickly as if I gave him a triple dose of albuterol. And he had some study he was looking at, something had happened. It, it wasn't like a standard practice, but this is the Army, and we can do whatever we want. <laughs> this is one of our people. <laughs> So we did the triple dose, and this, this patient's heart pattern started getting a little bit better. But as it wore off, it started going a little more haywire. So they had to take him back into the OR and do another open heart surgery on him. And while he was in the OR, one of the residents working on the team came running into the respiratory department looking for me. And I have like a whole pile of patients that I'm taking care of, not just this one. He's saying, we need you in the OR right now and bring your whole fanny pack for all your stuff. And we need you in the OR. And my supervisor's like, no, she's got responsibilities. She's got other patients. And this doctor's like, give them to somebody else. We need her in the OR right now. They told me to get her right now. And my supervisor was so mad. Doctor's pulling rank on him. Take me in the OR. And the anesthesiologist, I'm gonna have to work with him put this nebulizer treatment in line to save this patient's life. The anesthesiologist doesn't know what this extra nebulizer treatment is gonna do to his airflow, how he's gonna monitor. So we had to work together, we had to figure something out, cut into this tubing, splice in my neb treatment. They have another person like doing stat, arterial blood gases on him and checking all his levels and we saved this guy. <laughs> It was, it was pretty crazy. Um, I don't know if it's standard practice now to do something like this, if, if these doctors manage to do like journals or not on this, but it was, it was pretty exciting and that man lived to see another day. <laughs>